Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I thought there were some more readings and stuff, so I was all relaxed. Um, <laughs> And then I spilled some ice water in my lap and woke right up. Uh, <laughs> now it, it's so it's so good to be here. It's such an honor to be here. I didn't know uh, much about Crested Butte. Um, I, I didn't know it was the uh, Colorado location for the Texas um, <laughs> relocation program. And uh, <laughs> you're all in witness protection, right? <laughs> uh, but seriously, I mean, I, this morning I, I hiked with my son and some great people up to uh, the peak. You know, we went to the meeting and then we zip lined and um, I'm sunburned now and my legs hurt and I need a chiropractor, but I'm having a great time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not kidding about <laughs> any of that. Um, but on a serious note, I brought my son, who's 14, and... Um, He's the kind of 14 that comes at me like this, and he um, doesn't want to be like me, you know, and he makes that real clear, and, and he's hard, to, hard. he's just difficult, and I've often questioned myself because I was raised in a pretty serious religious environment. I went to a private Catholic school. My parents were diehard Irish Catholics. My dad went to church every day, and because of some of the things that happened to me because of that, I chose not to raise my kids in any spiritual, religious environment at all. <clears throat> and we do what you just read. We, we threw our demonstration of our lives, try to show them that. But I've had lots of pangs of conscience about that, and I've questioned myself about that. <clears throat> and I just want to say to you people that I am over that now. Because watching Rory, you know, we were in the elevator on Sunday going up, and somebody said, well, how do you feel, you know, going around with your dad to these meetings? And he said, I've met the most amazing people. And he's, we've been on, on lifts going down from the mountain talking about our spiritual path. And I thought, I raised this kid soaking in a spiritual environment. I just didn't think of it because there was no church to go to. And we've had drunks on our couch, you know, and we've had, we have meetings in my house. And he just grew up, I've, he's never seen me drink. Um, so, and today when we were in the meadow, I didn't mean to get emotional this early. <laughs> I'm a leaker. Ken, Ken knows. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really um, a little, little concerned. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, and I totally forgot what I was going to say. Oh, so Judy, I think, led this meeting up when you take the chairlift up in, your, in this meeting. And the theme of the meeting was, you know, what do you want for next year? You know, and while we were sitting there, um, hiking up the mountain, and I've spent all this time with Rory just getting out here from L.A. We got up at 4 in the morning, and we've been very close and doing a lot of things. He slid on the rock into me, and his whole body was against mine. And he didn't move, you know. And um, she said, what do you want this year? And I was I just like, I don't want to move <laughs> you know, for a year. And, uh, and what I really meant was, I want this. This is what I want. And then I thought, hey, you got it. <laughs> it's like, you don't need to want it anymore. And um, and we we just had a great time. You know, we really did. And he he hugged me. Um, he hugged me in the room before I came back. And I said, I'm going to meditate. And he goes, can you meditate in a suit? Because <laughs> I meditate naked. And... Uh, I don't, I don't, yeah. Just yeah. uh, kidding. I probably have, but uh, um, but I love AA, and I, this is so just, it's just amazing. Now I get what everybody was talking about, right? And uh, I just want to thank everybody. You know, Buckley and Dana last night were great to me, and, um, you know, uh, tonight we had Dwight and Karen took us out, and, Elaine and Harry, and I think Alan's going to have his way with me tomorrow, and uh, <laughs> you guys are of service, and uh, and what I like about, I've kind of thought about this, I, I hope I don't go off half-cocked with this concept, but 
it seems like everybody knows a little bit. You just, like, you go to somebody and you go, hey, you know, what's happening? They go, oh, that's over there. And you go, well, what about this? And you go, I don't know. Go ask them. <laughs> and, okay. And, like, I have a different host every night. That's confusing. <laughs> right? I, I mean, I've been married to one woman, and I forget her name. And I, and I, I love her. And uh, so, but it's like AA, right? We're like, well, I know this. But they have that experience. Go be there with that experience, you know. And, and I can honestly say I have not stopped having a spiritual experience since I got in the car with, with Ken. And um, it's great to be here. It's great to be here. Uh, I love AA. I'm not sure. I've never, ever been able to um, to do this justice. I've never been able to come up here and describe what AA has done for me. Um I just haven't been able to do it. I, you know, I don't know how to do that. I, I can tell you the story, and I can tell you in advance I will fail uh, because you can't speak it. But um, I did not grow up in the chaos of an alcoholic family. Oh, I always say that. I mean, my parents were not alcoholics. My uh, family tree has been decimated by alcoholism. We were talking about it tonight driving up from dinner, and uh, you know, both my uncles on my mom's side died of alcoholism. Uh, my grandfather, my father's father, died of alcoholism in 1945. He was an investment banker. And on my dad's deathbed 10 years ago, my dad said, you know, the, my dad knew the guy that started your club. And I didn't say, and you're telling me this now, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, apparently Bill Wilson tried to help my grandfather get sober. And, but that's a secret, like every other damn thing in my family, you know. <laughs> it's like, uh, we're Irish Catholic, and what that means is if there's an elephant in the living room, we make a coffee table out of it, you know. <laughs> that's what it means. It isn't, no one's trying to be weird, that's our custom. And, uh, and I say there was an alcoholism in my family, but I'm the youngest of four in, a, in this family, and I'm the youngest by seven years. I'm, I'm the poster child for why Catholics don't use birth control. You know, I'm happy about that, and, uh, and I'm not Catholic anymore. Uh, but I'm seven years later, and I, so i got to watch these three other people, my sister and two brothers, and my two brothers are alcoholics. And my brother, just ahead of me, seven years later, was a drummer, and he looked like Paul McCartney. He's my idol. And he ruined my childhood. He ruined it. He made it a dark, dark place. He he was disappearing all the time and stealing cars and, and ending up in jail. And he was the smartest guy I knew. He was one of the talented, most talented guys I knew at the time. I'm, a, I'm actually much more talented than he is, but I was little. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, he encouraged me. You know, I'm a guitar player, and I was a guitar player for a living. And a lot of that is because my brother came in my room and said, practice all the time. You know, he just loved me in action. And I watched this chaos. So I didn't drink when everybody was drinking. You know, in high school, when everybody was sneaking beers and stuff, it was worse at my house than ever then. And uh, my brother had gotten his high school girlfriend pregnant, and then he'd gotten married, and then he'd gotten um, evicted from that, and then he was homeless, and it was a mess. And um, my, I grew up at a small Catholic school. I had the same six friends all my life. I mean, I, I, and they're good guys. And, and you know, I, I hear people say this, and I love, I love this about AA is the empathy of the, of the, the uh, specifics of a story, you know, and I had that feeling. I have these, I still have these friends. I'm going to be 50 years old in October, and I still have the same six friends. And about three years ago, I dawned on me that they weren't hanging out with me out of pity. <laughs> you know, I always thought, like, they were smarter and they were better at sports, and they were. I was not an athlete, you know, and they were – I just thought that, you know, they knew something I didn't know. And when they were drinking, I wasn't drinking. But my first drink was with them. We were – uh it was, I think, my senior year of high school. And we were having a party at this guy at this house in Manhattan, in Hermosa Beach, that overlooked the ocean. It was a big surfer family. Um, I can't mention their name, but they were uh, eight brothers and sisters, all surfers. Their parents kind of started surfing in Southern California. And so they had this big house, and, and six of us were there, and the parents were out of town, and they had a bottle of tequila. So six guys and a bottle of tequila is considered a, a party at a Catholic school. And uh, <laughs> being the the not drinking but not celibate one, I noticed it wasn't much of a party. <laughs> and they poured shots of, ja of uh, tequila, and they were taking shots. 
And that feeling of being ugly and uh, uncoordinated and like I didn't measure up was just exploding in me. And they were having a good time. They never pressured me to drink. And so I said, hey, I'll take a shot of, of that. And they didn't make a big deal out of it. They went, oh, great, you know. And, and then I took the shot. And I love describing this to you because only you know what happened. You know, this this sunlight. <laughs> in my chest and uh and twelve years of Catholic school guilt went oh, I'm here and uh and all my zits went you know and uh and I'm like I'm did I have to do, 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 do is there a bigger cup and uh that's how it went, you know and so I got a quaff cup, which is uh inappropriate for tequila and I found out why, you know, we um so I'm drinking this tequila, and I have to go to the bathroom, and I'm walking down this long hallway with these eight bedrooms, and suddenly I'm on a cruise ship, right? You know, I'm like, wow. And, uh, and, but I'm trying not to be lame, and, uh, and I turn into this bathroom, in this big marble bathroom, and uh, I sit down in the toilet, and I'm a good Catholic kid at this time, and uh, my last thought before I blacked out was... <laughs> God would not make your body so you could defecate and vomit at the same time. Because yeah. that would be an imperfect God. And, uh, and as you know, I'm wrong. And, uh, and uh, so I woke up. This is the best part of this story. Is I, uh, I woke up on the floor of the bathroom in a sleeping bag with a pillow under my head and this strong smell of bleach. And like I'd gone camping, you know. And, uh, and I'm looking around, my head is throbbing, you know. My mouth is dry. And I'm like, why did I sleep in here? There's eight bedrooms, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we always spent the night at their house because we surfed right in the morning, right out the front door. And we, so I get up, everyone's gone, everyone's at school. It's like the twilight zone, you know, and uh, I ride my bike, and I'm getting to school, and uh, halfway through the day, it occurred to me, it, it came back, you know, and I was like, I was shooting for cool. And I don't think you could get farther from cool, you know. They had to clean me up, you know. I was in between functions, and uh, <laughs> they, uh, and I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I played poker with those guys a couple weeks ago. We play every year. We had the 27th annual Bill Laveroni Poker Tournament because a friend of ours passed away. They have never mentioned that. I think they need CODA. <laughs> but, but they're just good people. They're good people. And you could see why maybe it didn't fit. I wasn't a good people. I wasn't. You know, I was a liar. I did things out of insecurity that were absurd. So I didn't drink again. And then I went to college, and uh, it just won't resonate out here, but I went to Chico State, you know. And our motto is, I think I went to Chico State. And, uh, <laughs> it's true. Now, right? That's true. And, uh, but just before I went to Chico State, my brother came home, and he came up to the porch, and he said, look, I got two weeks sober, 15 to whatever he had. And AA, and, and I could sure use a shower. And uh, can I come in? And my parents let him in. And he would, you know, we, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the J.D. Salinger books, but we were the Glass family. You know, there's no privacy in our house. And he would read the big book in the bathtub, and I would shave in the morning, and I'd look at that book. i think, what is in that magic book? Because we tried everything with him. You know, we kicked him out. We don't kick people out of our house. He was homeless. It killed my parents. And he's in there reading the book, and he would do things that were extraordinary for him, like tell the truth, you know. <laughs> and Because uh, all I could count on my brother doing was he used to rip off my paper route money, you know. That's 30 days of work, and you get like 40 bucks. And then he'd go drinking with it. And um, he was laying, and he's doing that. And I went off to college, and I forgot I didn't drink, you know. I forgot I didn't smoke pot and do acid. <laughs> it's Chico State, you know. Uh, it's not an outside issue. It's an educational issue. And, uh, but uh, I went there and, um, you know, I a, a lot of boring stuff happened. A lot of exciting things happened. I was alcoholic from the gate. Uh, 
I did a lot of bad things. I had a lot of success. I, I graduated with honors. Um, had a degree in literature and a minor in religious studies, and I played in the most popular band in Northern California. And we were making albums, and I, I chose a lifestyle where I could do what I liked to do. You know, we slept till 2 in the afternoon, and then we worked from 10 till 2 in the morning. And I, we all lived in this big house. It was, it was a big funk band, it was a 10-piece funk band. And we lived in a house out in the middle of an orchard. And even there, with these guys, I was the bad seed. <laughs> it's like, that's hard. One of the guys' name was Snake, you know. <laughs> that was his name. And uh, I didn't really know his name. I still don't know his name. He was Snake. I knew him for years. Uh, and there was a reason he was Snake, you know. And um, and I, I went on, the, I ended up on the East Coast playing with a band, and I drank myself. You know, this is my qualifier. I drank myself out of a rock and roll band. You know, I am alcoholic. And that's hard. You know, the bar is really low. It's, uh, it is, right? I mean, you know. And, uh, and it, you know, I joke about it, but, you know, when I had all that acne and I weighed 90 pounds in eighth grade and, and no girl would look at me, I was in my room playing guitar, you know. Because it loved me back, and I played hours a day. I still do. I have two guitars up in my room right now, and Roy and I have been playing together. And, and I played, you know, I remember I dated the head cheerleader in high school, and, and the, this football player came and threw me into my locker and said, why is Sandy going out with you? And it was like my head smashed into the metal. I said, because I can play Here Comes the Sun, you jerk, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and you're not sensitive. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I really love music. I love music. And uh, so I joke about drinking myself out of a rock and roll band, but I drink, that's like an astronaut almost going to the moon, you know. I had the dream. And everybody wanted that dream that I knew, and I got it. And, and I blew it, you know. And I blew it in very methodically. I mean, it wasn't like one day they went, hey, look, you're blowing it. It's like there were lots and lots of warnings and lots and lots of misbehavior. I would wake up in the wrong town, you know. And when you're on tour, you need the lead guitar player, you know, and uh, I'm in the wrong place. And uh, just lots, I, I really, it's, a, it's it breaks my heart that I did that. I worked all my life for that, you know, and so I had to come back to California. And I, when I got back to California, I lied. Um, and that was easy for me. And I told everybody I came back to Redondo Beach because my mom was dying of cancer. And the truth was, my mom was dying of cancer. And the lie was, that's why I came back. I would have, I would have missed her funeral. There's no doubt in my mind that I would have. And I got to tell you, I really loved her. I loved my mom purely. She always made me feel separate, and I wasn't like my brother. They never held that over me, that he was such a train wreck. She encouraged the music, even though it went against everything in her. She was raised in the Depression. I remember my poor older mother would say, how are your gigs, honey? <laughs> I just almost would cry. I'm like, you just said gigs, you know. And, because she was trying so hard. She just always made me feel special. And I would have missed her funeral. I know I would have. And I used her sickness as an excuse for coming home. And I got this job. I got this job at a, as a waiter at a Marie Callender's restaurant. It's a coffee shop pie place. And um, I remember I got this waiter job, and I thought, well, you know, I'm a waiter. I'm still kind of an artist, right? If you're a waiter, like, you're not really committed to that. You're an artist. You're just figuring out your next move. And, and then, like, three days, and I thought it was the lamest, lamest job. And like, three days into this job, they go, hey, we just looked at your application. You went to college. And I go, yeah. And they said, do you want to be the weekend manager? I was like, no, man, you know, that's so lame, you know. <laughs> I'm the weekend manager. I'm not an artist anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but I was in debt everywhere. And I said, sure, yeah, okay. And um, it was so beneath me to do this job. And they took me around the restaurant. And they go, well, here's the, you know, the schedule for the cooks. And here's the combination for the safe. And here are the keys to the bar. And suddenly I thought, you know, I, I've developed a lot of skills that would be worthy of this job, and I'd probably be really great at it. And uh, I just looked at the keys, and the guy kept talking, and, and um, there were all these waitresses that were, you know, 17, 18 years old. I was 30 years old, and I did – I managed the restaurant this way. I would hover over the last customers and just hover until they left, you know, because they were bugging me. And uh, 
And then they leave, and I get the waitresses up to the bar and drinks around the house, you know. And the idea was to drink with these waitresses and go home with one of them, you know. And that did happen occasionally, but what mostly happened is like two or three in the morning, they go, hey, you know, we got a hot tub at this apartment. We just all rent this apartment. You want to come to our place? And I'd be like, you know, why would we leave here? You know, we got all this. Yeah, I had all this alcohol, and I'd sit by myself in the bar. Because I couldn't stop. You know, I, I wanted to stop. I wanted to go home with them. And then uh, it was so weird. They fired me. <laughs> yeah, like, it was, you know, like, and I was like, you can't fire me. This job is beneath me, you know. <laughs> Don't you know that? In, in spite of the fact that I can't seem to do it, you know. I never did the books. I never did anything right. And just as I'm gotten fired, this waitress comes up to me and says, hey, I'm pregnant. Yeah, that's what I said. And, uh, <laughs> I said it with a lot more feeling than you did. Uh, and you know, this is awful to say, but I want to tell you really who's up in front of you today. I want to be honest about what it was like. And I'm going to alienate all the women, and I'm just being honest. If you lined up the waitresses from Marie Calendars and said, which one do you want to get pregnant, I would have said, not her. <laughs> Maybe her. She seems nice, but that one seems, this is the truth. She seems selfish and self-centered. <laughs> I stand before you now. She was 18 years old. She was accepted to a college. I was 30 years old. And she just, I changed her whole life. And I left that meeting and... And uh, it's kind of a funny story, actually. I acted, I walked out into the parking lot pretending I still knew where my car was. You know, I had dignity. And uh, I'm pacing around and I'm figuring out how to get out of there because I'd lost my car a long time ago. And I went around to the bus stop. And the bus stop is right in front of the Alano Club in Hermosa Beach. But I didn't know what that was. And But there also it's right in front of the Civic Center where they, at that time, they trained like, um, mentally retarded and autistic young adults how to live on their own. They taught them, like, skills, like, you know, how to cook and pay their bills and stuff. And I walk up to this bus stop, and I got my Marie Callender's bag on, you know, and my tie, and I got snot coming out of my nose, and I can't believe this girl's pregnant, and I can't believe I lost this lame job. And there's, like, nine or ten of these young, mentally retarded young adults standing there. And I walk up to the bus stop, and I'm so humiliated, and I'm looking around, and I step off on the Pacific Coast Highway, and I look down the street to see if the bus is coming, and ten mentally retarded people went, Don't stand in the street! Don't stand in the street! <laughs> and scared the hell out of me. Because <laughs> I thought they saw the bus, you know. And, uh, and I let back on the curb, you know, and uh, I'm looking around. They were just very concerned for my well-being. And... Uh, you know, and I got, I graduated with honors, man, and I'm like, they're better at this than I am. <laughs> and, uh, and I got on the bus, and I, I went home to drink myself to death. That was my plan. And uh, my mom was dying, and I'm drinking, and uh, I'm not coming to the door. I'm not answering the phone, and I'm not visiting that girl. And, you know, and I want to say, you know, my mother and father um, – were adorable together. They uh, my, they adored each other. My father uh, never said that stuff like the ball and chain, and he didn't even, not even for a second with the kid about that. He called my mom the greatest thing that ever happened to him, and he called her that for 50 years. And my mother was this, my dad was boisterous and, and you know, Irish and funny and, and insecure. But my father, my mother was this quiet school teacher who observed, you know, and watched it all and just loving, you know, and they just treated each other with respect. And I had this great example, you know. And when that girl was eight months pregnant, I pushed her down a flight of stairs. And I didn't do that because I wanted to hurt her. I didn't want to hurt her. I didn't, I didn't want to hurt that baby. But they had, she had come over and said, um, you know, we need to go to the doctor today. And, and I would like it if you didn't drink today. And I was drunk already. And it seemed like she was shouting at me, you know, and I pushed her, and I just pushed her to get her out of the door. And I closed the door, and I didn't even look. I heard her fall, but I went inside, and I had a drink. That's what it was like for me. I started off with every advantage. I had loving parents who worked two jobs to send me to college. I had brothers and sisters that thought I walked on water. I had a work ethic. 
I had the example of a good, loving relationship, and I just pawned it all to pay for the party. Because once you light that match for me, I'm done, you know. Every day that during that pregnancy, I would wake up in my apartment and I'd think, I'm going to get a job today. I'm going to go see that girl's parents today. I'm going to visit my mom today. And I meant it. But And I'd say, the last thing I'd say is, I'm not going to have a drink today. And I had alcohol pulsating through my body. I very rarely slept. And I might as well have said, I know now, because I've been an Alcoholics Anonymous for 19 years, is that I might as well have said, today I'm going to hold back the Pacific Ocean. I didn't know that. I didn't know I was powerless. I thought I could pull it out at the last minute. I always pulled it out at the last minute. I graduated with honors, you know, and I crammed, and I wrote papers the night before. I'd show up for recording sessions not knowing anything, and I'd wing it, and I'd pull it out, and I couldn't pull it out, and I couldn't pull it out, and I wanted to die. I put a gun in my mouth many times in the middle of the night. So on May, my sobriety date is May 16th, 1993, and about May 14th, my, uh, brother called, and I have to kind of give you the preface. I would call my mom during moments of clarity and say, Mom, I'm going to come visit you. My mom lives about two miles away. And she would say, every time, she said, that would be lovely, darling. All she ever said. And I said, I'm going to come visit you. And if you put a gun to my head, I think I'm going to visit you. I, I, that's what I'm going to do. And then I'd hang up the phone and I'd walk towards the door. And I'd think, you know, I'm going to have one drink because I don't have a job and i got this teenage girl who's pregnant and, and I've I'm in debt to everybody, and I got warrants out for my arrest, and, you know, I can't stand in front of that woman like this. I'm going to have one drink. And if you said, are you going to have one drink? I'd say, I'm going to, that's it, and I'm going. And you guys know what happened. You know, I lit the match. I lit the match. And I never went. I never went to see my mom. And my brother called on May 14th and said, hey, he's sober about 12 years at this time. And he said, hey, it's Mother's Day, and we want to make sure you're, you're going to come. And I got indignant. I go, why would you think I'm not going to come? And no one had seen me. No one had laid eyes on me for six months. And my brother said, well, I'll come get you. And he came over, and he, no one thought I had a drinking problem. No one thought I had a drug problem. That was n my brother. And when my brother arrived, what walked out the front door to meet him, I weighed 108 pounds. <clears throat> you could see my entire skeleton. I couldn't stop talking. <clears throat> I was very much delusional. I, wanted, I put a clean shirt on. I remember that. My brother took me down to the King Harbor Yacht Club in Redondo Beach because there was a brunch there for my, and my mom was going to have Mother's Day. My brother flew in from San Francisco. My sister came. We're all together. And my brother was stunned, you know. And he took me down to the Yacht Club, and we walked inside, and my dad was real nervous because my mom was real sick. My mom was dying. And um, he, when my dad gets nervous, he tells a lot of jokes. It's real easy to know. It's like he sends up red flags. He's nervous. And uh, I could tell he was nervous. And then everybody got quiet when they saw me, and I didn't know why. You know, and I heard this in Syracuse, New York, a couple of years ago. Somebody said this, and it's so true of my experience with alcoholism. If alcoholism took your life in one swoop, we'd all come to AA and get sober, right? But it takes a little, and you adjust. It takes a little more, and you adjust. And then one day you're living in squalor. I didn't know I weighed 108 pounds. I wasn't weighing myself. You know, the mirrors were all covered up because people were coming out of those mirrors. And uh, I had swap-proof blankets on the windows. Everybody had, anybody have those? <laughs> They're going to stop them. And, uh, and that's, that incredible self-centeredness. You know, the entire city of Redondo Beach is focused on me, you know. But uh, we went to the Yacht Club, and I made a fool of myself, and, and they turned away from me, and my brother drove me home out of mercy. And we got home, and he... Uh, we got to fight. We were arguing on the way home. I remember that. We were, like, screaming at each other. And uh, we did that from time to time. We never – it was like it was like two ducks running into each other in a pond. You'd, like, and then you just float away. I mean, we didn't <laughs> – no hard feelings, right? We're Irish. And uh, this is how it is. And we were fighting about something. We don't know what it is. We both talked about it since. And I came inside my house, and I was so sick of being the little brother, you know. I was so sick of losing all the time. And I was so sick of all that – stupid condescending crap and I slammed the door and what I was really trying to do was block out the utter humiliation of what had just happened and I paced around my living room and I'm waiting for my brother to get home because I'm going to win this one damn it you know and I call him up and I start screaming at him and I'm, I'm going to win you know 
and I, it wasn't a dialogue. I was, it was, I was attacking, and I, I listed all the reasons I was right, and then he was quiet for a long time, and I was quiet, and he finally said into the phone, Matthew, I believe that you may have a problem with alcoholism. And I look at this moment as a moment of amazing grace in my life. Not that he said that. I mean, I'd heard that, you know, uh, you know, from a lot of people. A lot of people I respected more than I respected him. And, uh, but he said it, and the reason it was a moment of grace is I remember this moment. I was looking. I had this green shag carpet that was just full of crap, and I had these Venetian blinds. And I remember how the light hit the carpet because I said back to him, of course I do. And I didn't know, I wasn't going to say that. I wasn't going to say that just before I said it. I didn't, still don't know why I said it. But I worked the first step, didn't I? I admitted it. And I admitted it to somebody I was a little afraid of. And I still don't know why I did that. And he said the funniest thing, anybody, his response was hilarious. He goes, don't go anywhere. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll clear my calendar, but <laughs> I've been sitting on this side of the couch for three months. I was moving over there, <laughs> but uh, I had left my apartment forever, you know. I live right next door to a liquor store. I went in my pajamas, you know, and uh, <laughs> well, they were hospital pants, you know. They were, <laughs> I have class, and uh, he, came, he was at my door faster than should have been humanly possible from where he lived, and he later told me, I saw the window. I saw the window of willingness. And he took me down to the beach, and we sat on the beach and on a lifeguard stand. And he sat there clear-eyed, you know. And he did this weird thing. Um, it's still, I still am so grateful for the way he did this. He started talking to me about how he felt when my mom and dad kicked him out of the house when he was 17 or 18 years old. And I remember that day because I was 11. And he started talking to me about how he felt when his wife and child kicked him out of their house, and I remember that day because I was 16. He started talking to me about how he felt when he was living in his car, and I remember because I used to go to high school and try to find his car, and I'd look in the window to see if he was breathing. And in the middle of doing that, he started describing how I felt at that moment sitting on the lifeguard stand. And I didn't think there was a human being on earth who knew how I felt. I was filled with self-loathing. And yet I was filled with arrogance. I wanted to battle my way out, and I wanted to surrender and cry. And he just described this thing, and he won my confidence. And I, I would love to tell you I saw the light, but I, I ran out of cigarettes. <laughs> I did. That's what happened. I, you're like, oh, crap, he's still talking. You know, and uh, so I threw my hands up, and I said, you know, man, you're right. I got to go to AA. And he looked right at me, and he, he kind of came back into his face, and he laughed. He laughed right at me. He goes, you're not going to AA, man. You're going to a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> and I looked at him, and totally seriously, I said, I cannot do that. I am busy. You know. <laughs> right? And I met it. I thought I was busy, you know. And he would start looking over my head, and I'm like, you know, I go, how long do I have to go? He goes, no, 28 days. And I'm like, I can't leave all this, you know. <laughs> 28, you know. Who's not going to answer the phone? I'm the guy not answering the phone. <laughs> Who's not going to pay the bills? I do not pay the bills at that apartment, you know. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, you know, like, I'm, I'm busy sitting on the couch. And, uh. He ignored me, and he later, I said, what were you thinking about? He goes, I was thinking about how to get you into the hospital before you died. And I'm his younger brother by seven years. And he said, you look so much older than me. And I was so thin and so dependent on something going in me all the time. I wasn't addicted to heroin or anything like that. I drank all day. I smoked pot all day. I did whatever was around I just, whatever it would be like, you know, I spent, I caused more pain for me trying to avoid pain. And it just got so big, you know, and we walked back to the house and he said, he said that, he said, don't die. And I thought he knew about the gun under my couch. I was embarrassed about that. And uh, on May 16th, 1993, the phone rang and uh, I thought it was him, so I answered it. I just, I'd been up all night getting ready for rehab, you know, and... Uh, well, I'm not a slacker. Man. 
Actually, I passed out. I fell face down on the floor, and the phone was right next to my head, and it rang, and I picked it up thinking it was him coming to get me, and it was this woman. I used to be able to say I didn't know who it was, but about a year ago, she introduced herself to me, 18 years later, and it was a woman. She said, hey, your daughter was born, and we've been looking all over for you, and I forgot about that. And I said, okay. And she said, can you come to the hospital? And I said, of course. And I had my hospital pants on, and uh, so I was ready. And uh, I had my flip-flops on. I had this T-shirt, and it had a tear in it. And uh, it was my favorite. And uh, it was. You know, I wore it all the time. And I ran out with my car key, like like it was uh, some sort of homing device, you know, (laughs) trying to find my car. And I found my car. And I took all the parking tickets and threw them in my back seat. And I drove to – this is great. So we read the book. I read the book a lot with guys. And when it says our, our you know, selfishness and self-centeredness, that is the root of our problem. I went to the hospital where I was born. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they weren't there. Uh, uh, but that's where babies come from, right? You know. And I'm, I'm like, in the, like, all 108 pounds of me is insisting she look again, you know. And I and then I went out to the car going, wow, what am I? Oh yeah, and you know Anna had told me many many times where this baby was born, and I went there and I ran up to the maternity ward and I was running down the hall reading the numbers and I wasn't preparing myself, I wasn't thinking about what was about to happen, and I turned the corner and there they are. Well, I didn't know, not them, Anna, and she looks up and she's so happy to see me, and I was humiliated, you know. The last time I saw her. I pushed her down a flight of stairs, and I had forgotten about that. And she looked at me with such happiness, and she got up, and she's coming at me. I thought, oh, she's going to hug me. I can't have that. And she's coming at me, and she stops. And I oh, thank God, because I smell bad, and I, I feel awful and ugly and dirty and hungover. And she turns to this rectangular glass thing, and she pulls out this angel of God named Phoebe Rose. And she puts her in my arms, and, you know, I would love to tell you, I would love to tell you that I saw the miracle of birth. I would love to tell you I felt the connection with this person. I did not. I felt uglier and more dirty and filthy than I've ever felt in my life. She was perfect and innocent and just radiant. I don't know if you have experience, but they have, like, little tiny fingernails, and, uh, (laughs) like, she was beautiful, like, breathtaking. And I felt like I was looking at her from Mars. And I lied to Anna. I said, everything's going to be okay. And I prayed. My first prayer in sobriety. And my prayer was, I pray to you, God, that these two women never see me again. Because I'm going to do something really stupid. I'm going to hurt them. I'm not even going to mean to do it. It's just what I do. And I ran out of that hospital. And I was going back for plan A, you know. And uh, my brother... Totally screwed it up, standing on my porch when I got there. And he said, what happened? Where have you been? And I said, you know, my daughter was born today. And he didn't say anything. He didn't say congratulations. He didn't say, are they healthy? He didn't say, what's her name? He looked at me really sadly and said, get in the car. And we got in the car and we went to this hospital. And I don't know what happened at that hospital, but 30 days later I gained 47 pounds. You know? <laughs> I know we did stuff. And, uh... I'm sure we talked about our feelings and stuff, but uh, <laughs> but I slept for a couple of days, and uh, and then they dragged me around, and uh, and I got home from the hospital, and my brother drove me home, and he said, go to a meeting. I remember thinking, these AA guys are a little intense, you know. <laughs> I got 30 days, right? I'm not going to go to a meeting. Yeah, it's like I've just been in the hospital. I've been at like eight meetings a day, you know. <laughs> I've got 30 days. I'm healthy. I'm going to go see mom. I'm going to go see Anna's parents. I'm going to visit my daughter. Okay, I'll go to a meeting. You know, I was like, God, he's lame, you know. And I get out of his car, and I walk up to my door, and I open my door, and somebody hands me a beer. And actually, I, it wasn't a beer. It was a Coors. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I always censored that a million times, but it's true. And I was like, wow. And uh, they were doing snorting cocaine on the glass table and smoking pot in the kitchen and uh, – all my favorite Olympic events. And um, I backed out of that room and I put that beer on the floor and on the ground of the porch and I ran away. And who here is in their first year of sobriety? 
Raise your hand. Oh, good. Six people. Uh, Ten people, maybe. So I want to say this to you. I did not run away because I had a foundation of recovery. I did not run away because I'd had a psychic change. I had had not those things. The only, I had a nanosecond to make this decision. And what I had in the world was 30 days of sobriety. That was it. I didn't have self-respect. I didn't have character. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a lot of love and support. I had one out from my arrest, but I had 30 days. So when I ran away from that porch, all I knew was I'm not blowing that 30 days on those losers. You know, I can't tell you, just this weekend, I spent so much time having these great, intelligent conversations with all these people, and it made me think of the years I spent having monosyllabic conversations with people <laughs> playing darts, you know, because beer was there. And uh, I just ran away, and I didn't know if I was running to drink. I don't know if I was. I just ran away, and I ran to a payphone. There's some young people in here. They were glass, and uh, <laughs> they were, like, rectangular, and... They were like little time machines. And, uh, and I called AA. I called AA, and Mr. English Major couldn't find it in the phone book. Um, I couldn't. I was looking in the back. I thought it was under embarrassing stuff. And, uh, and then I found it, and the poor guy, I called AA, and I, he goes, hello. And I go, blah, 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 you know. I'm all down to cancer on the bar. Of course, you know. And, uh, I like, I really, I told the guy like almost everything I told you, probably more. And I was like, I thought he was going to help, so I thought he needs to know, you know. <laughs> and I tell him all this stuff, and he was so great, perfect. Yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you? You know. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm at the corner of Burl and Redon or wherever I was. And he flipping through some papers. I can hear him on the phone. He goes, God, this is so weird. And I go, what? And he said. There's a meeting across the street from that payphone. It's going to start in 15 minutes. And I said, so what do you think I should do? Right? I'm not going there. Yeah. I thought the guy was going to help me, you know. I don't want to. Okay, it's great you're getting together, but, uh, but I explained my problems, right? And, uh, and you know, I knew what to do. I, he, he was very shocked by that. And, uh, he said, well, I, yeah, I think you should go to the meeting. And, uh, <laughs> so I walked across. I remember I walked around the block because I was afraid to go in. And I went in, and uh, it wasn't great, you know. It was scary. I was so self-conscious. And it seemed like my first several meetings, if you're new, you probably get this, right? There were all these people, and there'd be like one chair in the middle with a green spotlight on it. You know, it's like, you have to walk over there. And... Uh, <laughs> And I would go, and I got, I, I, did, I want to tell you some amazing things that happened to me in sobriety. So I'm just going to tell you, I immediately got a sponsor. Uh, that, that night, I was walking out, and a guy said, let me drive you back to your house. And I said, you can't drive me back to my house. And he said, why not? And I told him about it. And he, and he was a friend of my brother's, and he said, don't your parents live near here? And this is important. I should tell you this. I said, yeah, my parents live about two miles that way. And he said, well, I'll take you there. And I said, no, man, you are not going to take me there. And I want to describe this because I wish somebody had talked to me about this. There was my perception of going over there. And my perception was, you know, my parents at that time had been married to each other for 45 years. My mother is dying of cancer. My father is beside himself. They are very good people. They're a loser son, fresh out of rehab with an illegitimate child with a teenage girl that's not showing up on their porch tonight. I'm not adding that burden to them. I'm not embarrassing them that way. I don't know if they even would let me in. I'm not doing that. It's the worst thing. It would be humiliating for me to go into that house. It would be the worst thing for them. So the guy drops me off at my parents' house. And, uh, cause you don't listen. And, uh, and he drives off. And, uh, I walk up and I knock on the door and they open the door and they're happy to see me. Like that kind of happy that you can't even fake, you know, like that, this joy behind their eyes. And that was my perception. And over here in reality, these people are married for 45 years. They're madly in love with each other. My mom's dying of cancer. And the one person in their life that's keeping them awake at night showed up and said, help me. It was their dreams. That was the reality. I didn't know that. How could I know that? 
And I went into that house, and I'd love to tell you, you know, oh, my God, I was comfortable. I was so uncomfortable. They, they put me in my old bedroom. I had a life-size poster of Eric Clapton. I'm like, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. I put it up when I was 14. I talked to that poster from 14 to, like, 35, you know. <laughs> I walked in. I'm like, I can't believe this. And I woke up in the morning. I was so scared. And I ran out, and I said, Dad, there's a 7 a.m. meeting down here. If I, You know, I got this thing, and can I borrow the car? And he said, if you're going to a meeting, you can borrow the car. So I went to the meeting. And I thought, well, I've got to leave the uncomfortable place, you know. And I got to the meeting and found the second most uncomfortable place, you know. <laughs> you people. And uh, I'd go in there and sit, and everybody was wah, 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 wah. And I'm, like, looking around going, I wonder when they start speaking English, you know. And, uh, and I'd leave right when the meeting was over. And I'd drive back home, and I'd go, Dad, there's a meeting at noon if I get at the club. If I could I borrow your car? And I'd go from the uncomfortable place to the other uncomfortable place, you know. But what I watched in that house for a year, for a whole year, first of all, I did a lot of bad things. And it kind of came to the surface when I went into rehab. And my parents didn't mention them one time. They loved me from that moment forward. They were good, dignified, loving people. I also watched my mother take care of my father in his grief at the thought of losing her. It was so beautiful. And so, I can't even, I, could, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I thought it was the worst thing. So I went to AA, you know, I got a sponsor. I remember walking with my sponsor once, and I was walking out of the meeting, and I go, or walking in, he gave me a ride. And I go, yeah, I can't believe how much I love my daughter. You know, I didn't think this was a good thing, being a father, right the day I got sober. And, you know, it's just, I don't think Ann and I are going to get married, but, man, I love that little girl. I love her more than I love myself. And he just walked right by me. You know, and I'm selfish and insecure. And my thought was, really, I thought, I did not know he was deaf in his left ear, you know. <laughs> maybe I always sit on his right side. And, uh, and I'm looking at him across the room. He didn't like me. He didn't like me. You know, what, what was that about, right? And then we're walking back out. And I go, maybe you don't understand what I'm trying to say because you don't have kids. But I love this little girl more than I love myself. And he put his hand up and he said, how much child support do you pay? And I said, oh, my God, I live with my mom and dad. I work from a, at a newspaper from midnight to four in the morning, stacking you know, newspapers on a loading dock. He goes, I know all that. How much job support do you pay? So well, I don't pay any. And he said, then you're kind of full of it, huh? And I went, what? And he said, this is a program of action, Matthew. It's not a program of talk. He goes, you must know that. You go to six gazillion meetings a week, you know. <laughs> he said, why don't you show me you love your daughter? And don't tell me that ever again. It was a very uncomfortable drive home. It was uh, <laughs> very quiet. And uh, I was plotting his death, and he was living in the present moment, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I got in, and Eric and I had a long talk about what a dick he was. And, uh, you know, and Eric Clapton's a very quiet and wise man. He never kind of... <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm walking around my room all red-faced, you know. And then, like, on my 50th lap around my tiny bedroom in my old parents' house, where it's hard to have your dignity at 31, and uh, I made the turn and thought, you know why your red-faced man is? He's right. He's so right. He just told you the truth. You're trying to make somebody like you on the tender of, I love my daughter. And you haven't done anything to prove that. So I called Anna, and I said, hey, you know, I should give you some money. And she said, that would be great. And I didn't make any money. And she said, well, let's do a percentage of your paycheck. And every two weeks, I pay that money. Every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks. And I, I want to say to the people who are new in your first couple of years, I want to be real honest. I didn't pay that money because I want to be a good dad. Not at all. Didn't even cross my mind. I didn't pay that money for any other reason but two reasons. The first reason, the most important reason, was I never want to drink alcohol again. It's hell for me. It tears me to ribbons. And I knew my sponsor kind of made it sound like that's going to lead to that. And the second reason was the only spiritual experience I had in my first year of sobriety was holding Phoebe Rose. And it was very hard to walk into that house with those parents of that teenage girl and walk by them and go into that bedroom and play with that girl and then go to work every day. And I felt like I was paying my ticket. I felt like I was paying my dues. Those two people never said anything bad to me. They, one of them just passed away, and he left me a watch. He left me a family heirloom watch. Phoebe's grandfather. We're, uh, 
I don't know how this happens, you know. But I paid that money every two weeks. And after a while, I thought, it's kind of weird, you know. I walk into these big AA meetings, and you guys see me, and you don't jump up and applaud. You know, and I'm looking at the grapevine going, where's the Matthew Pace child support? He's a hell of a guy article, you know. <laughs> I bought the grapevine for that article. And, uh, and you know, you guys are kind of laughing at me. Yeah, I get it. But, but I'll bring it home to you. You know, remember, you know, when you got your license and, and registration and insurance, you're sober a while, and you walk up to your... Your AA buddy, you got sober with you, and you go, hey, I got my license. And they go, hey, you're 40. <laughs> it's like, wow, yeah. <laughs> you should have a license, yeah. That's what I wanted, like a parade, right, for, for pants, like what other people do every day. But I'll tell you, after about a year, I was playing with Phoebe. I remember this very clearly. I'm playing with Phoebe, and, and we're laughing and rocking, and she's pulling on me. And, and I'm like, Phoebe, I'm your dad. You know, I'm going to take you to your first day of kindergarten. I'm going to take you to your first day of first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I'm going to buy you a car when you're 16. I'm going to take you to the dance. I'm going to save money and send you to college, baby. I'm going to know you for the rest of your life. One year before that, I prayed a righteous prayer that I never see those women again. And through the actions of Alcoholic Anonymous and the strong sponsorship, I came into my body and my heart and my soul. And I wanted to be there forever. I took Phoebe to her first day of kindergarten. I took her to her first day of first grade. I cried every time. She's like, Dad, don't come. <laughs> I took her to second and third grade. I bought her a car when she was 16. She wrecked it like a week later. I'm no more cars for Phoebe. Uh, I'm paying for college. That's why I'm so thin. And, uh, she's 19. We're 19. May 16th, we turned 19. She gave me a cake. Yeah. Applaud for God. Right? So, I have a couple other things I want to tell you. One was that, uh, you know, I was saying this prayer. I was, it was so funny. I was telling my sponsor, I go, you know, I'm praying that prayer relieve me of the bondage of self. And he goes, that's great. And I, because I know the bondage of self. I mean, I think we all do. But it's that constant, the sort of narrator. <laughs> you know, I got a narrator. Now you're lame because of this, you know. And that wasn't entirely true. How are you going to sleep, you know? She doesn't like you, you know. I got, that's self. That's myself, talking to myself, you know. That's my friend. And uh, I got the bondage, the bondage. I can't get out of me. I can't get out of me. How's he going to look for me? What's going to happen to me? What if I don't do that, right? And I had this bond, and I, said, I found that prayer. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I might better do thy will. And my sponsor says, why don't you help God out? And relieve yourself of the bondage of self. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? You know, it's like swallowing your tongue. You know, how do you relieve yourself of the bondage of self? And he said, well, why don't you do something good and don't tell anybody? Like, do something nice for somebody. I'm like, okay. So we're at the Monday Night Men's Day, my home group, that night. And this guy walks in from Australia, and we, we ask, you know, are there any people from out of town, because I'm visiting from Australia, I'm going to be here once a month, and I went, I'll remember his name, you know, <laughs> that will be my altruistic act, you know, and I'll be relieved of the body itself, <laughs> you know, so a month later, he comes in, and I forgot all about that guy, you know, and uh, he walks in, and it's like a dance, I'm like, oh, Kevin's here, you know, like running across the room, you know. I'm going to be relieved soon of the bondage of self. And, uh, and I run up to him and I go, Kevin, welcome back to the greatest meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in the entire world. And he goes, wow, you remembered my name. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, it must be hard traveling. This is a great meeting. You landed on your feet, man. This is where it happens. This is the epicenter of sobriety, you know. And he said, boy, you're really enthusiastic. And I said, yeah. And he goes, come outside and talk to me. And we walked outside and he goes, what do you do for a living? I go, I stuck, well, you know, stuff on a loading dock, and, uh, and I drive, <laughs> and uh, I'm very satisfied in my work, and, uh, and I live with my mom and my dad, and uh, I'm a tough guy, and, uh, and he says, why don't you uh, print out your DMV, wear a suit, and come to this address, and uh, maybe I have a job for you, and I picked up his card, and he was vice president of an international airline. So I got my black suit and my brown hush puppy shoes. Because <laughs> that's what I had. And, uh, 
And I went there, and we got up, and uh, I got this big, house, big office on Century, big glass office, and I knock on the door, and he's in AA, right? He answers the door himself, and he looks at my shoes and laughs out loud. Have my shoes. <laughs> so now I go, <laughs> and I got my DMV. It's like the size of a phone book, right? And DUI. I didn't show up for court. Went back to jail, you know. And uh, I walk in, and, and he introduces me to this beautiful Hawaiian girl and says, she's the human resources person. She's going to talk to you. So he walks into his office, and she walks into her, and she's looking at me in my shoes. <laughs> and we walk in. Her office is backed up against his office, and we walk in there, and she's flipping through my DMV and looking at my uh, my application. You know, a big seven-year gone-to-the-party gap in my application. And uh, she's looking at my shoes, and she goes, excuse me. She's really pretty, so I'm totally intimidated. And she goes, excuse me just a second. And she goes to the office behind in his office, and I hear through the wall. He goes, he's not going to fly the goddamn plane. He's going to put people on him. <laughs> and I got really relaxed. <laughs> and she looked pretty nervous. <laughs> and she goes, we're going to hire you. I'm like, damn straight you're going to hire me. <laughs> it's a bargain. And the reason I tell that story is I made this tiny, tiny, tiny baby step towards God. And he came rushing at me. And it's happened over and over and over and over again. You know, I got to work at the airport and they paid me this money to clean the suit they gave me, which was smart of them. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I was able to buy a guitar. I love to play guitar, but I loved it more than anything. And I bought this beautiful guitar and I got to work and I, nobody trusted me at work because I was hired by the vice president and I didn't drink. <laughs> like, who's the mole? Plus, I really liked the job. Like, I was like, this is great. I remember this guy next to me goes, this job's hell, huh? And I'm like, oh, no, man, I've been to hell. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And he's like, what's with this guy? Yeah, I know. So I didn't have any friends at the job. So I brought the guitar, and I want to show somebody, but I put it in my locker, right? And then I come out, and it's 1030. We go to the bus. I bring my guitar, and I'm like, you know, if there's a lot of guitar players here. I know because there's Texans here. And uh, and guitar, a new guitar case is sexy, right? And I'm like, I, I'm like, I can't wait to get home to have relations, and uh, and I'm standing there at the bus stop, and this woman walks up next to me from British Airways, and I turn and go, hey, can I show you my new guitar? And she turns to me and says, I don't look at strange men's guitars. <laughs> and I go, oh, and I thought, and I immediately thought, she thinks I'm hitting on her. I'm not, I don't even know what she looks like. I just, it's, I don't care if it's Frankenstein. I want to show my guitar to somebody. So we get on the bus, and it's packed, because by the time it gets to the international tournament, the ter terminal is very full. And she's pressed against me, right? And I, she's really uncomfortable. She has this book, Surprised by Joy, by C.S. Lewis in her hand. And I said, I've read that book. And she said, well, cut to the chase. Do you believe in God? And I'm like, God saved my life, you know. And she got even scared her, and, uh, or more scared. And uh, all the blood drained out of her face, you know. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm not doing very well with this girl. And uh, so I said, hey, what do you think? And we started talking about God, you know. And um, we got to the end of the line, and I'm looking at her. We're talking, and I'm like, God, she's really pretty. I didn't know. She looked like Audrey Hepburn. She has blue eyes and short, dark hair and a long, thin neck. And she gets off the bus, and I go, hey, you know, I've just really enjoyed this. Maybe we could forget about this guitar and maybe have dinner sometime. You know? And she did not think so. <laughs> she's like, no, no, no. She said, you know, you can't hit on girls waiting for buses that they have to wait for. That's not okay. I can look at my guitar. I've read that. But <laughs> Yeah. So I was like, wow, you know, I thought we were just getting along. And, uh, and she took off. And, you know, I, I joke about this, but it is it has an air of truth to it. You know, I, I, I knew that I had grown spiritually because I went to work the next day, and I didn't tell anybody she was a lesbian. Right? <laughs> That's nobody's business, right? And uh, I'm okay, she's okay, we're okay. And... Uh, but, you know, it, it couldn't be she rejected me. She rejected my gender. You know, it's like, but it, and honestly, I did grow spiritually because she was beautiful. She was beautiful. And she did not reject me. I made the wrong, I made her feel uncomfortable. And I was self-aware enough through the steps of this program to know that. I made her uncomfortable. I wished I hadn't. I felt like I missed a beautiful opportunity. 
And I went to work the next day, and I I only thought about her like 60 or 70 times, like hardly at all. Yeah. <laughs> and I got off work, and I ran to catch the earlier bus, hoping she wouldn't be there, and she comes trotting up, you know, and I thought, well, I don't have a guitar. She will not recognize me. And, uh, <laughs> and she tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think I was rude to you. Do you want to have coffee? I don't want to have dinner with you. I don't, she said, but I'll have coffee with you tonight if you want to miss this bus. And on July 27th, we celebrated 16 years of marriage. Come on. Miracle. I converted a lesbian, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. When I got married, you know, um, I said to my sponsor, I go, she's not blonde, she's not anorexic, she's not addicted to heroin, she's really not my type, you know, and, uh, and he said, right, you've changed, you know, and, and, you know, I had a problem with the 11th step, I came to the 11th step with a lot of baggage from the Catholic Church, and when it said, prayed only for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out, I didn't know what that meant, that seemed scary, I didn't want to know God's will for me, God's will for me was punishment. And my sponsor, when I brought this to him, thought about it for a long time. He gave me a couple of days, and he said, I think you're thinking about it too much, Matthew. I think God's will for you is when the alarm clock goes off, get up. I think God's saying, get up. I think God's will for you is when Phoebe's diaper needs change, and he says, hey, time to change the baby. I think God's will for you is when a bill comes in the mail and says, pay this amount. God says, hey, let's pay that amount. I think that's God's will. So when I got married to my wife, we got married in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Uh, and we got my mom home before she died one more time. And we got married on a lawn in front of a lake in a house that's been in my family for a long time. A little tiny house. We're not a wealthy family. Just a little summer house. And has a pier out in front of it. And before I, she came out of that door and walked across the lawn and married me, I walked down to that pier and I said, Thank you, God, that this is the next indicated thing. Because <laughs> it's not always a dirty diaper. It's not always a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. I was there when Rory was born. I took my wife to the right hospital. She's in my car. And we went, and, uh, and I did that with Sophie, our little girl, you know. And for five years, Philip and I had an amazing time. We traveled all over the world. We had flight benefits. We took the kids. We just grabbed them by the scrub. Let's go, you know. And uh, we never fought. We never fought. We didn't have a fight for five years. And um, I came home one day, and uh, she was on the floor, and um, she had a massive stroke. And she lost a big piece of her brain, and, uh, lost complete use of the left side of her body. And, um, that was 10 years ago, and uh, 11 years now, and she's never going to be the same, you know. Uh, and you know, the thing about it is, I've heard the talk tonight, I know what Ken's going to talk about, and I, I know uh, I was so moved by Georgia, and uh, so many things happened around that time, and I don't, I'm running out of time, I just want to tell you this, like, my wife hit the ground, and I came through the door, and I called an ambulance, and I walked out the door and left my children alone in my house, because I'm with her when that ambulance came. And the neighbors walked in, they saw the sirens, and they took my children, and we went to the hospital, and I followed. They wouldn't let me go in the ambulance. I followed her, and we got to the hospital. I live in a big city, and I got to the hospital, and I went inside, and um, they said, she's very sick, we can't help her, we're calling the helicopter. And they called the helicopter, and I got in the helicopter, and I went to a different place. On the way to the hospital, I called my sponsor, I called my sister, and I called her parents in England. And we'd gone to one hospital, flown to another hospital. They tried a radical operation on her, and it didn't it failed. And the guy said, I don't know if she's going to live, man. And at midnight, I walked out into the waiting room, and it was full of the men, the Monday night men's bag. And they found me. And what that shouted to me is, you are not going to do this by yourself. And my sponsor said, they say there's no big deals in AA. He goes, that's not true. <laughs> this is a big one. But I'm here with you. And we walked through it, you know. And I got to tell you, you know, it's been 11 years, and I'm not great at it. You know, she has brain damage. That's frustrating. But we love, love, love each other so much. She is so cool, you know. She's even funnier now. <laughs> she can't remember stuff, you know. I often think I could use that to my advantage. And uh, But, you know, I want to wrap up because I've run out of time. I don't want to wrap up. I want to tell you a thousand other amazing things. But, you know, a couple things is, you know, I pushed a girl down a flight of stairs, and I didn't think twice about it. I dressed and undressed my wife 
I think it's an honor. It's never, ever been a chore in 11 years. Other stuff's been a chore. I'm not going to lie to you. It's like walking through mud, living with somebody day to day that has brain damage. It's not easy. I'm bad at it some days. She's bad at it some days. You know, it's kind of funny. My wife said something that is really true. I said, man, we're just trying to get all our ducks in a row. And she said, if we do that, can we tack their feet to the ground? (laughs) Because they don't do that. You know, I got good at at Rory when he was 12. And then he turned 13, you know. (laughs) My wife's relationship with her disability is not static. It's dynamic. Some days she's depressed. Some days she's mad at me for helping her. Some days she's like, hey, let's go. And we have great adventures. We have great adventures. But I want to tell you, there's a lie we tell in AA. I'm going to finish with this. And we tell this lie, and we mean the best. We mean the best, but we, we lie. And this lie is when a newcomer comes up and we go, you knew? Yeah, and you go, You're, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> wow, really? You know, everything's going to be all right. We say that all the time, right? And that's a lie. Right? We, we heard it. We're going to hear it. You know, what I found out is things are going to be what things are going to be, like they are for everybody. Parents die. My mother died in my arms. Good jobs happen. I have great adventures. I have great life. I have a great life. My wife and I love each other. We're, I said to my sponsor the other day, I go, I'm just not married to the same girl I was 10 years ago. He said, join the club. <laughs> and, uh, but the point is, is we don't mean that thing, everything's going to be all right. What we mean is, if you do this stuff, no matter what, you're going to be all right. And that's my experience. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.